So I've been trying to learn Blender on and off for the last few years, and the same thing pretty much always happens. I get stuck on some part of a workflow that I can't get past, and I quickly lose motivation, and then I find myself not using Blender for a long period of time, and it just kind of bums me out. That's why I've decided to start to invite guests here on my channel to collaborate, real industry pros that can teach me the proper way to do things in Blender. So my first guest today is Elizabeth Rosenblum from Luminarc Labs. Elizabeth is gonna show us how to use Blender Blender GIS. This is an add-on that allows you to create professional 3D maps inside of Blender. Now, I've actually played around with this add-on a few times before, but same old story. I always get stuck in some part of the workflow, lose my motivation. So let's see if Elizabeth can help us figure out how this works. I am a geospatial analyst and information design specialist. So I work with companies in order to actually visualize statistics in a way that people can understand. That often takes place in the form of maps. My background is in GIS and environmental science. And so I got really interested in Blender specifically because I was always interested in the intersection between art and science. My first project was map oriented. So it was taking some data from a analysis that I had done. And I was trying to just like plug it into Blender. And I found that there were so few tutorials for this online. And that's what inspired me to start making more material, more content about this area specifically, like GIS and data visualization inside of Blender. So this is what a lot of people call data storytelling. And it's the area that I'm the most interested in. Yeah, I found Blender to be a really useful tool in leveraging data and precision within something that a lot of people are more captivated by than like a 2D graph or like your standard map. This is the GitHub folder for Blender GIS for the plugin. You need to go into here and then download the zip. Something happens on a map versus on uh, Windows that I've noticed through other people's computers. It's not everybody's, but sometimes your file will automatically unzip and you need it to be a zipped file. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is just open up a general file and I can delete my default cube by just simply hitting the letter key X as in xylophone. Next, I already have my plugin installed, but we're gonna go through how to install it on yours. This will work on any version after 4.1. And if you have any problems with the 4.1 version, I would just recommend downloading a new version. If you ever have a problem with this plugin, yeah, just try a new version. Sometimes the problem is that this is not standardized because of just the computer that you're running it on, plus the version of Blender, plus the plugin that you that you downloaded because they've gone through different iterations of the same plugin. So I'm gonna go into edit and then I'm going to go into preferences and you can see your add-ons right here where it says add-ons. And I'm going to, a lot of Blender versions look a little bit different and some of them don't have this exact UI, but you should see a little drop down carrot and it'll say something like install from disk. So I'm gonna click on that. So navigate to wherever you have your Blender GIS folder, and then you're going to say install from disk. And here I'll see that I have Blender GIS installed. If you don't see it, you can just look it up and you should see Blender GIS and make sure that it's selected. And I'm gonna do the little drop down. We're gonna go really quickly through the presets on this, just so that you understand what these terms all mean. So the SRS, the Spatial Reference System, is Web Mercator. This is the most popular projection system and um, has a lot of controversy around it, but this is what you're typically going to be using. And if you're not importing other data, you probably don't have to pay attention to the SRS, but if you're ever planning on importing data, then you would really need to know what the SRS is because you're going to need to reference the same spatial system in order for it to overlay perfectly on your map. And making sure that you have your cache folder as whatever folder you want to save your files to is quite helpful because it's going to be exporting a bunch of satellite imagery onto um, your desktop or your documents, wherever you're saving it to. Here we can see that we can actually import and export buildings, which is incredible. So you can actually import and export 3D buildings, highways, land use, leisure, natural, railway, and waterways. 
And this is where we're going to enter our open topography API key. So another ingredient for this to work for you is to create an open topography account. We're going to include a link in either the description or comments. And the key part of this is that um, it's providing the elevation data that I previously mentioned. So this is in 30 meters. So this is a 30 meter resolution DEM, which is actually not great, but it's okay for like a medium size area. So this is one of the downsides of this plugin is the highest resolution that you can get with using open topography is 30 meters. So imagine that as something definitely larger than a neighborhood that you'd wanna visualize and around the size of a medium sized city. You could do a large city as well if you wanted to visualize that topography data. Um, but I'm trying to get that into view um, the practical uses of this plugin specifically so that you have a smooth surface because what you're working with is basically large pixels when you're working with a larger DEM. So we should see a little icon that says GIS. In the GIS plugin, we are going to see import and uh, web geodata. We're going to click on base map and you can see here that you can choose from a variety of different sources. So from OSM to Esri. But I'm just going to stick with the default and we can get just satellite imagery or we can do map, which would be um, more of the illustrated version. So I'm going to click OK. And then what can be kind of confusing about this is I'm in GIS mode. So what that means is I can't actually do any other functions unless I hit escape. And how you can, can tell that you're out of GIS mode is you're no longer going to see coordinates showing up here. And how I can re-enter that is I need to go GIS and then click base map again. Hit OK. So what this means is now it's calling to that API and we can select these tiles. So I'm going to zoom in by just, I'm using a mouse, but you can scroll or zoom in regularly on your keypad. There's two main commands that you should remember or write down somewhere. The hotkey B gives me crosshairs and I can use those crosshairs to zoom into a particular region of the world. The second command would be G. So the hotkey G is going to allow me to look up a place. So let's say I want to do Park City, Utah, which is where I'm from. Something to note is that the best zoom level through the workshops that we've done seems to be something between 12 and 16. And the reason between um, with that threshold is because it's hard to call the data at a lower resolution because if you imagine there's specific tiles, there's individual tiles that are all composite to make one image. It can't call all of that data so easily at a very large zoom level, so something like this. But at 12, it can more easily call all of those tiles, and it, this seems to be kind of a Goldilocks principle of these tiles because at 16, that's kind of maximum res. Similarly, when you're zooming in further, it's calling a lot of tiles and it can sometimes cause quite a lag. You're welcome to try anything, but at greater than 16, you're also kind of running against your DEM. So that's at 30 meter resolution. It's not going to look as smooth if you have something like a really zoomed in part of a neighborhood and then only a 30 meter DEM. Okay, so I'm happy with where I've selected in this city. So I'm going to press the letter key L as in lock, and this is gonna lock my resolution. It's great to do this because now it's not calling at the tiles anymore. And if I press E, we can imagine that that's exporting my image. For Blender beginners, what might be a little bit confusing here is maybe you don't see anything. So this is the viewport shading up here in the upper right-hand corner of your viewport. And your viewport is everywhere that you can see this grid and the object that you're working on. And you can simply switch over to your shading viewport, which is this quarter shaded circle for you to be able to see your plane more clearly. So we can imagine that this was a giant map, but it's a digital map. And now we've turned it into a static object by basically printing it out. So now I want to put 
the open topography data in there, which is going to make this really cool extrusion happen. Um, in other words, the mountains are going to be raised, and I'm now going to have a 3D object. So I'm going to go into GIS, Web Geodata. I'm going to say Get Elevation. So you can see here, I can enter my API key. My API key was already entered when we set up the plugin. So I'm going to press OK. It may not look incredibly extruded, like the difference in between my mountains and my valleys might not be as high as I want. Especially if you're working with kind of a flat area for certain people, when they try this out, they go, oh, well, it just like didn't work at all. But it's really generally because if you imagine from a satellite view and with the proportions in mind, the disparity between the hills, well, in this case, they're mountains, the valleys and the mountains is what we would imagine from really far away. So it's accurate, but it's not necessarily causing the visual effect that I want. So I'm gonna go into my modifiers. This is your properties panel. And I'm gonna click on this little wrench here. And I can see here that I have two modifiers that have been employed automatically through the plugin. And that's the subdivision surface, which is this upper one. And that one is splitting this surface into individual segments so that it's more flexible. We can think of it like we started with a sheet of metal, which is quite inflexible. And then we took a razor and created segments within it so that it could more easily be bent and draped over the object, which is our digital elevation. So then our second modifier is this displacement modifier. So if you want to increase the strength of this, then you can do that by bumping this up right here where it says strength. So I'm just going to increase that. And we can see as I go, that disparity becomes clearer and I have some more emphasized mountains. So I'm just going to try something like 2.5 and we're just going to see where that goes. And that looks pretty good. So of course, we want to be careful about what data we're representing and making sure that we're staying accurate. So now I have greater emphasis in the mountains and we're just going to do this one more time. So I'm going to show you guys how to import the OSM data, the buildings and highways, infrastructure data that you might want to put on your map. So we're just going to redo this. I'm going to take this away and we're going to go through the same steps. This time I'm just going to do Esri data for fun. Now I'm going to click G and we're going to do San Francisco. So I may want to zoom in a little bit closer to San Francisco if I want to have my OSM data imported without any problems. This is pretty bulky in terms of a data import. So it can make your blender crash. So that's why we're kind of, we're doing a new example just to kind of show you guys what that might look like. I'm going to zoom in here where we can see Treasure Island and Yerba Buena Island and Alcatraz. Just a little bit of San Francisco as well. I'm happy with where I'm at on my map, so I'm going to press L and then E. And now to get my OSM data in there, I'm going to go into GIS, Web Geodata, get OSM. I'm going to select buildings. I'm going to say elevation from object and make sure that I've got my right object selected. So this plane here that we're looking at, that's my object. And this was Esri imagery. So we're going to say export Esri. And then we're going to just keep the default settings, see how it looks. And I'm not going to separate the objects because that's going to create a bunch of different buildings and it's a little bit more difficult to start moving those around and modifying them. So I'm going to press OK. Amazing. OK, so that was super quick. I actually have my 3D buildings now. I can make them larger, but if we look at them from this view, we can see that now I have 3D buildings in there. But I love this because now we have everything that's geo-referenced and it's just put super easily on our map. Um, and you can do all types of things with this type of data. So this is really the tip of the iceberg with Blender. Of course, there's going to be a lot of things that you want to do with Blender. You're going to want to learn a lot about lighting. You're going to want to learn about shading. You're going to learn, want to learn about maybe if this isn't high enough resolution, how could you make this better? Or how could you make a modified landscape that doesn't look like 
uh, normal satellite imagery. So if you're interested in learning about terrain modeling and all the complexities and exciting parts that go into that, there's a workshop that I offer through the School of Information Design called Blender Plus GIS for beginners. We'll link the waitlist in the description of the video. You're welcome to sign up. It's a limited group. It's a small cohort so that we can answer everybody's questions. There's a lot of troubleshooting involved and that allows you to make a polished project for a portfolio piece and ultimately move on with uh, learning Blender in a way that allows you to troubleshoot with a cohort and in live, which is quite helpful for people, especially because it's just, it's, it's a software that can be quite buggy and people can get stopped at like any point and it just might lead to like a like a string of like five youtube videos only to fix one problem okay so there you have it i hope you enjoyed this look at blender gis from elizabeth rosenblum this month for my exclusive tutorial over on my patreon page i'm going to do kind of an extension to this tutorial and i'm going to show you how to turn some of these terrains and 3d buildings and 3D scenes into actual 3D models that you can very easily bring into Adobe After Effects and animate them inside of After Effects. Now I've only just started playing with this after Elizabeth taught me how to properly use Blender GIS. So it's only gonna get better. I'm finally reached the point where I'm gonna get into Blender tutorials. So the moment has arrived. Thank you, Elizabeth. Stay tuned.